Alrighty, we're recording and this is um, our first uh, article study or study group and it's uh, fashioned after a book study. So I've been, fig I've been writing for Clean Run Magazine since 2009 and I've been trying to figure out how to um, utilize some of that work. So I came up with this idea and this is our maiden voyage. So thank you all so much for coming. And um, I'm gonna be really curious as to um, what you think when it's over, if you wanna do it again, if you found value in it. Not to um, interrupt, I'm just, uh, you know, you won't see us because we're trying to trace Keen down, but I'll go off mute and we'll, there you go. We'll get them. Okay. Yep. Um, so are you, so Tammy, you're actually not muted. There, there we go. Um, so did everybody get a chance to read the article? And you, I can see you nodding your heads or thumbs up work. If you need to get my attention with a question, you can um, wave. There's also a way for you to raise your hand at the bottom of the participants um, slide. So this article was called um, Blabbermouth or Silent but Deadly. And I don't know if you could tell, but it really got a lot deeper into training than just whether verbals are better or whether physical cues are better. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some things outside of the article before I open it up to um, a discussion. And I'm hoping that this truly, that you guys are comfortable enough to have a discussion. And you can go into particulars about your own dog or just things that you've heard. One of the things that I bring up a lot when I'm talking to groups is um, the peanut gallery at dog shows. And um, uh, I, I, I'm a fly on the wall sometimes at dog shows, and, and I hear a lot of discussions about what's best. You know, verbals are better because I think the dog blah, blah, blah. And well, I think physical cues are better because um, I believe that the dog's blah, blah, blah. And the thing of it is, is this is just a tip of the day. When you're discussing what's best for a dog at a trial, it would be best to be discussing it with somebody that knows the dog. <laughs> because there's what's best for that dog and it's based on learning history and a lot of its breed. I called myself a breed-based trainer in the webinar on Saturday. And um, what I mean by that is I have worked with lots of breeds and they learn and they interpret lessons differently. And what's good for the goose isn't always good for the gander when it comes for, to choosing. The other thing I want to touch on that's not really in the article is I think one of the trickier bits about training dogs is knowing when something isn't working. If it's not working because you haven't done it long enough or it's not working because it's not the right thing for that dog. And in recent years, our, our community has gotten itself to a place where we're always hearing, you should find what's best for your dog. And a lot of my students, um, especially if they've got a new dog, might not have the experience to really know right off the bat when you present the dog with something brand new, if it's just the dog needs more exposure and a little bit more training, or if it's truly the wrong thing. So that's a place where a professional can really help you, where you can just say, you know, I've been doing this for as long as I think I should be doing it to be getting a better or different result. So I need some help figuring out if I'm just on the wrong track or if I haven't given it the college try, I haven't given it enough of a chance. And um, because a lot of times you guys, I see handlers abandon ship on something that their dog could really benefit from 
because the dog isn't picking it up as quick as the handler thinks they should be. And knowing how fast a dog should be grasping a concept is really not something we're privy to. We have to ask the dog. We have to say to the dog, are you um, understanding this to the point where we're making progress? And if the dog isn't, again, bouncing it off of your trainer or bouncing it off of a person, maybe not just your best friend, but somebody that's familiar with your breed, um, somebody that's got some experience. You know, I've been on this, I, I'll have people all the time, that's one of my first questions. Well, this isn't working. Well, how long have you been doing it? I've done 10 sessions. Well, that particular thing would take more than 10 sessions or the 10 sessions you should have it. So maybe there's just some little thing that's not being done just right. So I'm a little bit off topic there on the silent but deadly but uh, blabber mouth, but it is when you're trying to figure out what's best for your dog. So one thing that's different, so I wrote that article, I think in 2013, and one thing that's different that I'll tell you about is the jump command. So I talk about using a generic jump word when I talk about the difference in the types of um, verbal, uh, there's directionals, there's obstacles, there's gas pedal words. And I, in, in the obstacle section, I talk about whether or not to use the word jump. In recent years, I have more specific words for my jump command. So I have a backside, I have a jump it tight, a wrap, I have a jump it big, an extension. So I rarely have the need to just call a jump a jump. I'm thinking my dog already knows it's a jump. That thing's a jump, he's like, yeah, I know, what do you want me to do with it? So I actually kind of look at my jumps now as little um, props and there's like parlor tricks that you do on a jump. So as you're heading up to the jump, I'm gonna tell you what trick I want you to do. If I want you to jump it big in extension, if I want you to wrap it tight to the left, if I want you to wrap it tight to the right towards me or away from me, or if I want you to go around it and take it from the backside. So I rarely have the need to use a generic jump cue. There's almost always something more specific for me to tell the dog. The other thing that I would have um, added to this article if I was writing it again tomorrow is under, and there's not much, um, but there's just these two things under, again, types of verbal obstacles. Um, there's obstacle commands, directional commands, gas pedal words, and I also now have um, collection cues. So gas pedal words are pretty much go on, go on, go, 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 go. They're going extension, take off. They have a specific inflection. They mean go, go, go. And then my, um, my breaking, I have a breaking inflection for my dig, 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 or rap, rap, rap. They have a different sound. So now I would say I have obstacle commands, directional commands, gas pedal words and breaking. Uh, and I, what I mean by breaking is slowing down. So um, how many of you, when I was writing about tucks and the poles um, knew what I meant? Did you know what I meant when I talked about tuxedo and the weave poles? Passing the weave poles. Do I have one head shaking? No. Nani? So you can unmute. Does anybody want to ask me anything about that? I'll go into it. But if you if you had a question about it, let me know now what your question was. You can just unmute yourself. So I've got some thumbs up. So what I did is I drew, I read it and I read it and I thought, how many people are going to understand what I meant? So I drew it on Clean Run Course Designer. So I'm going to share screen with you now. And what was happening, so you guys, this is a little, that article went way beyond just how to decide whether or not to talk or not to talk. I hope you noticed that. So what I was doing, I had talks and um, I was just, you know, in a, in a regular old sequence and I had been obsessing on the weave poles in his training. 
And I had gone from this tunnel to those poles with a couple of different, in a couple of different scenarios. So I had been over here where the cursor is. So what I was doing is I was just running and I was about where I am now. So I'm paralleling his path. He's to go straight and I'm to go straight. And when he came out of the tunnel, he was turning right and going to those weave poles. And I've positioned him, I hope you can see it. I've positioned him kind of how I imagine him to be in the tunnel that when he actually exited that tunnel, there's a really good chance that he saw the poles. He absolutely did have to pass them to come with me. So I ran and he hooked off to the poles and he hooked off to the poles again and he hooked off to the poles again. And each time he hooked off to the poles, I got to about here and then I just stopped. And somebody was in the building and they said, why don't you just call him? And when I talk to my dogs on course and when I don't talk to my dogs on course is dictated by whether or not I'm expecting them to have an eye on me or not. And I got to thinking about that because I want my jobs, my dog's job description super, super clear. So when I was thinking about it, I decided I had to be fair and I had to be clear about what I wanted. So I decided that if I was behind the dog, I couldn't expect him to see me. And I would always use verbals if I was behind the dog. So here I'm clearly ahead. And if I had said, come when he was in the tunnel, guys, he would have come and taken the jump. If I had said, come when he was in the tunnel, he would have never flipped off to those poles in a million years. So anybody, the person in the building is like, why don't you just call him? Just help him, just call him. And it was because in this scenario on course, when I'm running ahead and I'm paralleling a path, I can't be worried about, is he gonna nick off of me every time he sees something he wants? That we have to have some basic core system of communication. If you're ahead of me and the line is correct and I'm moving, you can't nick off and go left, right, whatever you wanna do and have whichever obstacle smells good that day. So I just kept showing him, if you go to the polls, the game is over. I just stopped. I refused to call in the tunnel. I refused to call when he went to the polls. And it took, I don't know, five times. He loves the wee polls. No mama me weave, no mama me weave. But once I just let him figure it out, he came with me every time. That was a turning point in our training. Um, and now he's, he's really quite good about just coming with me. So that is a, a little tiny bit off topic about whether or not in general to talk more or to talk less. This is actually training of when I want to use verbals long ter term versus um, physical cues. Now, if I had been running in this direction, can you see that little guy? Tammy and Elena, can you see him? Because I can see you guys. Can you nod? Yeah. So if I was running that direction directly towards the jump, then I would be pushing on this line and then I'd be cueing the pole. So I had to be really, really, really sure that first time he nicked off to those poles that I was indeed setting the correct line before he exited. So I just thought I would show that to you because I thought it might be a little unclear. Before we leave that, are there any questions? You can unmute yourself and just ask. Sandy, I have a question. Yep. How did you know, because like if that were me, I would have just said, oh, I need to call him. I, I need to just say here and get him to go to the jump. It would never occur to me that I needed to do what you did. I don't know how you knew to make that decision to keep working and not call him? Because I know how much I need and want my dogs to understand. And I know, I always go to this word in my head called reasonable. So I thought, I said to myself, is if it wasn't reasonable, Lonnie, like say, say the poles were like here, 
you know, then that's not reasonable because he's actually exiting at that, at that um, poll entry. But I asked myself two things. Is it reasonable for him to just come with me when I've got a correct line set? And two, do I need him to be able to do that? Do I need to rely on that? And then the other part of the question I asked myself was, will I ever be in trouble if I've cued him to go straight and he turns off of me? And the other question is, is can I always, always, always know when I have to call and when I don't? So once I realized I'm not going to be able to determine that when I've set a straight line, that it's likely that he's not going to understand that it's a straight line. I just wrote an article about straight lines, um, oddly enough. And um, in this case, no, I'm ahead. He can see me. I need him to learn to keep one eye on me. So then I would say, well, how important is it for the dog to keep one eye on me coming out of a tunnel? How important is it? And I decided it was important. So I had to go through a checklist in my head to say, am I wrong to not just call here? But when I get down and look at the tunnel, I can say that jump is obvious. He is having to do a drastic turn off of me. And will it be a problem in my future if Tux doesn't think it's a big deal to not have one eye on me and to turn off? So the reason I was able to make that decision of should I just call or should I, is this something I have to stop and train was because I looked down the road into the future of what am I going to need and what is going to serve me well going forward. And him. So may, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So how does that affect, you know, the training that you have always taught me is that because you want them to know what is going to happen coming out of the tunnel when they cannot see, which is exactly what you're discussing. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. To me, what you're saying was as much as I very much understand exactly what you're saying, it's a little bit contradictory of you're giving good. them the cue so they know I where they're you. going coming out. Oh, no, girl, I got you. I've, I got I will you. now unmute or mute myself. Okay, I got you so covered. Best question there. So you guys, in the article, I talk extensively about training versus handling. So, and I, and I teach them different, I do them different, and to me, they are as separate worlds as Earth and the moon. So, if, so Gwen, in competition, 100% I'd be calling, and I'd be calling when the dog is entering the tunnel, 100%. Because in competition, I'm combining my physicals and my verbals all the time so that I have superpowers. But in training, if I'm only using verbals, or I'm all, uh, skip that, it says it in the article, if I'm combining all the time in training, verbals and physicals, verbals and physicals, um, I'm never going to know which one my dog is getting stronger. So if I'm working on, hey, pal, you need to keep one eye on me. And if you're just looking for obstacles, that's telling me that he's not keeping one eye on me. And it tells me that he's saying to me, if she wants me, she'll call. If she wants me, she'll call. I never have to watch her. But I need a dog in agility that's going to listen and watch. So I'm saying by this alone, I'm saying when I'm ahead of you, you need to keep one eye on me, pal. So letting him go wrong in a training scenario in order to actually teach him to keep one eye on me is very different than trying to have crystal clear using all my ammunition at the same time. So this turned into a training scenario because he had a question. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, so that's all that I, I thought you might have a question about that scenario and I wanted to tell you that I now have way more words for jump than the generic jump cue and that I also have a collection cue for um, obstacles. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Whoop, I almost hit end meeting. Wouldn't that, that have been a disaster? Okay, do we have, can you guys see the normal? Thank you, Margaret. <laughs>
All right. Thanks for the thumbs up. Okay, go ahead and ask me questions about the article, guys. Be brave. Everybody knows if they want to talk in the polls or not. Everybody knows exactly where on the contact obstacle they want to use their verbal. Everybody knows when they start a go on and when they end their go on. Cue start and finish. Did the article spark any questions for you? I have a question. Yep. I did. About the polls. Okay. Uh, about talking in the polls. Because Tammy's always telling me to shut up when she's watching me. I mean, this is not a couple's issue, but, um, <laughs> and, and, and I always say, go, 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 go in the polls. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I've been experimenting a little bit with not talking, but you know, it's easier at home for him because, you know, he's not distracted by, you know, a trial or something like that. So he, he will go if I don't say go, 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 and he'll go if I do say go, 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 but yeah yeah just talk about the polls and talking so i'll ask you a couple of um questions about about that how do you are you good at it um sometimes i'm good at it. sometimes i do hair on fire i mean if i at my best self yes i'm go 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 and it's very rhythmic and i'm on you know i'm with him so sometimes i get hysterical so so I can do this, you guys. I can go and I could do that all day long. And I can go and I can do that all day long. So I'm good at it. Yeah. So I've taught myself a consistent inflection that I have practiced. So I'm not gonna be if I am talking in the polls, I'm doing it well. And there's how you feel. Like, does it, if it feels good to you, if it feels like a little bit of a distraction, or if your brain is going, oh, I'm not, I, I, because if you can't do the cadence, you can actually screw the dog up. Mm -hmm. And I, I, um, I have this little theory, it's unproven, um, but I've played with it a little bit with only a few dogs where, I matched them, like if they were a slow weaver, I went pull, 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 and matched their cadence and got good at that. And then the next time I trained, I upped it, pull, 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 pull. And I actually saw, honestly, some dogs match that cadence. And I wondered, gosh, could we teach this could we teach could dogs learn rhythm and i'm and i'm not sure but i have played with it and um and i've seen dogs you have to be good at doing it and i've seen dogs that i thought benefited and i've seen dogs that i thought did not benefit um i use i do say the polls command because i do such distance work and when i'm peeling off an obstacle because I want my dogs coming with me. I want my dogs thinking, when in doubt, go with mama. So when I'm peeling off and I don't want them to come, I'm reminding them to stay in their lane, especially if I'm not paralleling their path. So we could, I could have 20 agility experts in here arguing, well, the dog should just stay in the, the dog should just stay in the poles. But I find my dogs speed up. The clearer I am, the faster they go. So if I'm doing something that normally means come with me, to say you're not coming with me, this is the exception, I can say pull, 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 and I feel that I'm helping them go faster by staying in. Do I know dogs that are trained to the point, I mean, does every dog need that? I don't know. I, I suspect not. In fact, I, T Tybo wouldn't have needed it. I couldn't get him out of the polls. I could scream, no, come here, and he would finish the polls. So um, I would say experiment with it. But if you are using the verbal for far away like I do, I recommend also using it close up. I tried to go there. I tried to say, well, I'm not going to say it if I'm close, but I will say it if I'm peeling off or at a huge distance. And then I thought, why do I want, then what am I going to do math on every time I'm walking a course? If I'm, am I, you know, is this a time I do and that's a time I don't? So I say do it or don't. You also may find as a dog gets older and more proficient 
that they don't um, like it, they don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one thing I don't like in the we polls is saying different things. Yay, go to the boy, come on, let's go. I don't think that helps any dog. I've never seen that help a dog and I've yeah. not uh, um, all the multiple. So if you're gonna use a verbal in the polls, be good at it, train yourself to be good at it and then just experiment. Um, if you're using it at home, you can be prepared for him to rely, need it. And then you're gonna marry it. Anybody else? Thank you. Yep, when to say what, how much to say? Sandy, I, I had the same question. I'm really good at it. Yeah. And um, I, 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 I've tried not to use it to. It's like, I, I just don't want to risk him slowing down, doing anything weird. I think he likes it. How would I know if he didn't like it? That's a good question. How do you know when he doesn't like anything? He shut down. He goes slower. Does he have a different yeah. look on his face? Does he do stuff with his ears? That's a really, those are good questions. I, I should watch video and really hone in and see how, how he looks. Cause I think, I think he go, I think it makes him go faster, but I, I don't know. So, and, and you know, you guys, whenever our dogs do something different, we can't a thousand percent bank on it's the thing that we want them to. But um, I knew that this would come up at some point in this talk. I, I'm uh, collaborating in the mornings with um, uh, Dev and Becky on this, um, how to read your dog and how, and how to um, get on this page that trainers that I'm on, that um, some of your um, more experienced trainers are on with their dogs where we can see these subtle differences in their body language and how they're moving and how they look. You know, you can kind of, and you guys actually know, you do know, and Lonnie, I know you know too, because you're so incredibly, you have such an incredible connection with Jax, that there's just something, even if you can't describe it, and it's usually a little bit of an ear set or their eyes aren't quite as round, you know, the difference between that da, 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 and their ears and their eyes to, okay, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And, um, and you could time it too, but watching video is, um, is, is good. Very, very good. So play with it. And then it's, how do you feel? You know, do you find yourself, is it hard for you to stay connect? I, for me, when I'm talking in the polls, it helps me stay super connected to that pole 12. When I'm walking, of course, I'm staying visually, mentally, and verbally connected to that to those 12 poles, because I want to handle as much as I can, any little intensity that could help get them just a little bit more comfortable or faster. So playing with it, ask him, he'll tell you. Okay, thanks. But don't go back and forth. Okay. Uh, some okay. dogs will reach a level of maturity and a level of confidence where they will tell you, I'm sick of you talking to me now. Um, I have had dogs that just all of a sudden one day there was, they didn't look as happy in the polls and I shut up and they were like, thank God you started to get on my nerves. Okay. And that's reading your dog. We're going to have a lot more coming up on reading your dog and creating optimum uh, training environments through um, a program that's going to be called Ocean. <laughs> going deep with your dog. Questions? Did the article, did you like the article? Did it make you think about your dog? Yeah. Do you know if you're a blabber mouth or do you, so how many of you kind of have what you like, how you are, what pleases you as a handler and you suspect that maybe your dog doesn't, isn't on the same page? Has anybody made a decision to change what they're doing based on the article? I, I didn't make a decision to change, but I am very aware I'm a blabbermouth. So it made me, when I can train again, um, want to pay attention to how I am on the course, how, 
how much I talk to him. Does he does he need it? And just like your example with the weave poles, um, I, that's exciting to me to think about. Would I would I be able to just do that? Have him go through the tunnel over the jump without my saying here here jump. Um, so it, it, it caused me to question myself, but I did identify myself as a blabbermouth, sadly. Do you feel like when you're blabbering that you're, um, that you are, um, everything you say is significant? It's significant, but maybe not necessary. Um, specific, maybe. Specific is more of the is more oh. of the word. And are you planning? I'm going to start saying this when my dog is here, and I'm going to stop saying that when my dog is here. So, like your dig, dig, dig. Are you yeah. still, you guys? This is a good one. This is <laughs> this is an unnecessary blabbermouth. So, um, it, this is like if you're doing if you just get your dog out with two jumps and figure eight and see if you can make yourself shut up before the dog leaves the ground. So if you have two jumps and you're figure eighting those jumps or even stanchions and you're saying dig, 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 can you have your dig, dig, dig start early enough that you're actually done just before the dog gets to the stanchion? Or are you still saying dig, 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 dig as he's going around the stanchion the whole time? Because that's being a waste of time, blabbermouth. Because that means your brain, you're still saying, <laughs> the dog's already doing it and you're still telling him to do it. He's like, yeah, I'm, I was done when I got here. <laughs> Anne Marie? So I, I'm finding that um, I, don't, I don't know now, my two dogs are trained so differently that with the new dog, the puppy, I'm training him to listen to my cues as, as um, I can't be there and so listen to my voice. Um, it's also uh, when, you know, there's a question about two obstacles and maybe my line isn't set perfectly. And it's also a little bit like my verbals are now proofing each other. So when I'm training verbals and I say left, you know, does he start backing up? And so is he listening? Just just when he's like facing me. So we haven't really tested it, you know, out on a course in the heat of, you know, a trial because um, we're, we're, we're still training, but there's, there's, I have questions about verbals being proofed against each other. Um, you know, if I say dig, 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 and then leave, will he still do the wrap? And that depends on your maintenance program. That depends on when you say how often he gets to practice dig, 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 and you leaving. A lot of times when we're not focused on timing, we're doing crappy timing. So the dogs are getting used to being babysat. So we're, we're still, so one of the, so this teaching the dog to listen. Um, so with my puppy right now, I have this little game. I have a crate that's next to my bed. And um, when I get his dinner, I stand like a V, like a, you know, I think of it as the dog walk in the tunnel and I've got his bowl of food and I stand as still as I can and I hold his bowl of food and I try not to <laughs> lean and I'll say, hop on. And then I pay him for hopping on the bed. Or I'll say, get in, get in. And I pay him for getting in the crate. And I believe that I'm teaching him how to listen. And I also do sit down, stand left, right um, without movement. And I believe that I'm teaching him how to listen. And then I'll have lessons in agility, like I was saying a minute ago, where I'm teaching, watch me. And I'll have lessons in agility where I'm teaching, um, uh, listen to me. Since I've written the article, I have gotten very, very specific about when I talk and when I don't talk because I can't, I don't want to talk the whole time. For one thing, I can't breathe. I have to have air coming into my lungs. And the more I'm talking, the less brain juice I have going to my feet. 
I talked about that and I, I, I really love setting lines with my feet and I have job descriptions for my, uh, you know, I really am working quite hard to have my cueing system from head to toe consistent. So what I realized was, well, I'll just go ahead and behind. If I'm ahead, I'll do physical cues. And if I'm behind, I'll do verbals. Well, I tried that on for about a year and it, it wasn't that easy because guess what? There's a whole bunch of time that I'm not really ahead <laughs> and I'm not really, I'm kind of at the shoulder or the head or the rib cage of the dog, you know, I'm not fully ahead. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going to make some specific rules. If I'm six feet ahead, I'm ahead. And if I'm not six feet ahead, I'm talking. Because I wanted, I want my physical cues and my verbal cues to match. The other thing it was, I wanted my dogs to always default to turn toward me. No matter what I was doing, default turn toward me. So I'll tell you when I want you to turn away. And I won't tell you when I want you to turn into me. And I lived in that happy world for about 15 years. But course design, in my humble opinion, these days are too, is too complicated. And there's too many times where, because I work so hard to get my dog to understand physical cues, like if you're coming in and the dog anticipates a rear cross, but you were just coming in to get on that stanchion to wrap them, and you're not telling them this is a wrap, if you're approaching a jump at an angle, guys, your dog can't tell if you're setting a, driving a rear cross line or you're just driving. If you're approaching the jump from the side, the dog can't tell which stanchion you're going to. So therefore, I am uh, talking um, way more than I used to I'm uh, uh, because I can't hold the dog accountable when in doubt turns towards me and have a super strong rear cross physical cue. Am I losing anybody? You got me? Some of you, okay, good, 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 good. Questions? You guys must have a question about your own dogs. What about, do you know when to give your um, verbal cue on your contact obstacles? When's the best place, if those of you that have a two on, two off, when is the best place to say your contact word? Jen, don't answer. Not in the article. Now the newbie, so I'll try to try to guess. Um, Sky, my border collie, he's about three and a half years old, and he's pretty fast. He's obviously faster than I am. So I say the touch word as he's approaching the contact. So, so he's on, wait until the end. He's on the downside? No, as he's going up. So whether it's a dog walk or the A-frame, I am saying touch as he's going up because he'll fly over it in a heartbeat. Got it. Got it. So you're giving him plenty of warning. I like that. I, I say it by the middle of the obstacle is too late. So we are on the same page. Um, I do want my contact word to mean go, not stop. So when I say that, if that's like makes you scratch your head, um, check out my two on two off program because I do want the dog, I, I am telling the dog go on without me down to the bottom of the, um, to, of the obstacle. Um, Sandy? Yep. So you're saying on the contact obstacles, before they even get on the obstacle, is that too early? Or once they're on, but before they're very far? I have a word that means get on the thing because I teach discrimination. So if I've got a tunnel dog walk, so I'll say scramble to tell them to get on it. But by the time go. they're halfway across, if I haven't remembered to say their two on, two off command, I won't say it at all. Okay. Because I want that word to mean go, not stop. And if the dog is hearing that contact command as he's collecting to stop, it's, you know how you name a behavior? Like we taught him sit and then we named it sit. If they're mm -hmm. hearing touch, touch or target when they're slowing down, it becomes a slowdown word. 
And that's why we have dogs slowing down earlier and earlier and at different places when they hear that word, that word got mixed up. I want the word to mean extend and go faster. So it's actually a send cue. Touch is a send I have to say, oh, sorry. It's actually a send cue. It means go as fast as you can and oh, okay, stop when right. you get there. Yeah. Right. If they're hearing it as they're breaking anyways, because once right, they get right, right. starting okay. to break, I'm afraid that I'm naming slow down. You're naming the stop. I'm not yeah. just afraid. I know it's exactly what happens when people start to lose their contacts and then they start saying the word target, 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 target and the dog is hearing it as they're trying to break. And then the handler starts saying it sooner when I tell them to, and they're like, well, I can't say it there because he slows down because the behavior of breaking got named target. But this is interesting break. for me to hear because when I say, let's say teeter or climate for aim frame, then I say touch and I say, I've learned to have to do different ways for him to get his attention. But the touch is almost a way to drive him to the end. So he's not slowing down for us. Because you're saying it early. Because you say your command early. Got it. Okay. So that's permission to go. When he hears it, it's go to my place. So he's going to be an extension. If you were saying it at the last minute as he was stopping, that's how it would get ruined. Great, thank you. Follow me? Yeah. Yeah, you've got what you want because of that early cue. Becky? Um, and I, I um, on my contacts, I teach them the behavior is to run to the end and stop. Um, and I don't use a verbal. However, I have been known under the heat of competition, quiet, I, in the heat of the battle, if my dog flies over that apex or comes flying down that ramp, I, I do fall back on my little crutch and I will say, you touched. <laughs> um, so one could say, I suppose, that I'm breaking my own rule. Uh, how do you feel about that? It's just well, a safe I word, but... I, I, oh. I have, Reminder. Well, do they do they know the touch, or is it just sort of morphed into that? Did you oh, use no, touch absolutely any? know the touch? I can usually just say walk it. I don't have to say go touch. So they do know that. So you guys, I have the same thing when I'm when I'm practicing. I'm not using my verbal cue because I want the dog muscle memory. I want him to just, when I'm on this thing, I always stop. There's never a time I don't, so I don't have to be told. And then what Becky's saying in the heat of battle, if she's got a little bit more juice on her hands, if her dog is super excited, she can fall back and use that command. And I'll often use my command. I'm training the comprehension so high in training that I don't need the command in training and I can pull the command out that was used in the initial stages of training that the dog knows um, so that I'm putting a little bit more responsibility for comprehension of the um, behavior in um, training because the dog has learned to do it from a physical standpoint in training I thought you were going to say you you stay. No. So, no, so that's no. one that I'll just, just touch. I'll just touch on quickly. That is such a catch twenty two. That if you, because a lot of times if the dog is ahead of you and the dog, you guys, this is so common. The dog is ahead of you on the dog walk, and then when you pass them is when you release them. And you do that every time. So then they learn when she passes, I'll release myself. And if you didn't want to, they self-release. So you get, they train you and you start using that stay to remind them not to go. And then you get caught in this trap of, do, will I have to say stay or not? So the less verbals that you're using in training would mean the less verbal you're going to have to use in competition. And then it's a secret weapon if your dog is extra jacked up to go and use those secret weapons to help them because they're struggling, because they're excited and they need your help and they need those reminders. But if you're using stay to get your dog to do his contact in practice, your comprehension is much lower and you're not gonna get it in competition. 
So what you can get in competition without a lot of drive or in practice without a lot of drive, that drive, that extra um, drive could tip the scales that you might not get the behavior in competition. And this is the classic reason why we get sloppy performance in, in um, competition. Back so to- I'm, What I would say is it's a little bit different than being insecure about the, your, the behavior you've taught your dog and you get into a competition and you start saying, you touch, you touch, you touch when you typically don't say that. I mean, basically, aren't you just telling your dog, I don't trust you, I don't think you're gonna stop? As opposed to those moments when your dog's spewing spit and all amped up and you use it as a safety break. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes my dogs surprise me and um, whether or not you're going to use that emergency backup system to remind them to do their job or not is your, is your choice as a handler. If you think that they're aroused enough that they're not going to do their job, yes, you are saying I don't trust you for, for, for sure. And would you have more value to just let the chips fall? Absolutely. Did you just drive to Los Angeles and it's Grand Prix? <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to go there. I mean, that's what competition does. But, um, and there's been times where I have thought I, my dog is not in a mental state or really all it ever is, guys, really all it ever is for me is that I didn't do the level of maintenance training that week that my dog needs on that particular behavior. So if I've done my maintenance two weeks before a trial, I'm going to get my, my behavior. If I haven't, maybe I was sick, maybe I had a sprain and I'm, and I'm going in, then I'm going to cheat and use those extra verbals because I don't trust him because I didn't hold up my end of the training bargain. Dev? I have a question about when you give the a, a verbal direction, like a right or left or a tight or, you know, go on left on, let's say, a running A-frame. Mm -hmm. When you would give that. Exactly at the point the dog wants me to. So you guys, I'll, so, so discovering, this is a classic, this is a classic thing where, we, do, what do we do? Do we experiment endlessly is what I see people doing? Or do we decide, dog, I need to give it to you right here. And if you don't understand that, I'm going to hang in there and I'm going to teach you what I mean. So if you, a lot of the dogs on the running A-frames, if they, if the handler gives the command too soon, it causes the dog to come off the side. So then everyone in the class says, oh, that was too soon because you didn't get what you want. So then the handler goes, okay, that was too soon. I'll give it later. Well, then then it gets really stinking hard because now you're putting your timing into a one second or one split instant where you've got to be perfect every friggin' time or you're not going to get your behavior. So for me on the running A-frame, which I do not have, but I've coached plenty of people on it, I'm going to pick the spot where I can give the dog the command at ease at the same spot. And if my dog doesn't understand that timing, I'm going to teach the dog how to stay on that frame because that's the, that's the um, too late or too early. It's obvious what you get on both of them. It's the same thing with jumping. I'll see people give a perfectly timed left or right on approach to a jump and the dog will go left or right and not take the jump. And everyone will determine that the cue was given too early. Well, I'm not going to wait till that last second. I want my dog to have the freedom to collect up his body, have a second, instead of turn now, you're going to take the jump. So each time I say left where I want to, what's going to work for me, and my dog doesn't take the jump, I just help him. No, when I say left at this spot, it means, again, we're back to that key word I told Lonnie, reasonable. This is reasonable timing. It's okay that you didn't understand what I meant. I don't care that you don't understand. I'll help you figure, I'll help you see what I mean. But I'm training the timing that I need it to be enable in order to give it to the dog. Did that answer your question, Deb? I'm not sure if I answered yours. Yeah, either. no, no, thanks you did. That's because I'm, you know, I'm, when I get back to training, 
um, I was in the process of going from a stopped A-frame to a, to a running, and I was just curious if, um, you know, anyway, whenever we get back to training, <laughs> And I see another a lot of people will let their dogs teach them to give the commands later and later and later and later to where the it's just not gonna work i like to give my com if i can give my command early then i can and i can teach myself to look where we've gone into timing now which is my next favorite subject i don't have i just like they're all my favorite subjects <laughs> Let's talk about that now. Um, teaching yourself to watch your dog, you know, come down that A-frame and I'm going to give the command here because that's what works for me. I can't give it later and have it work every time. And I can't be perfect. I can't be perfect. I can't say, you know, I can do a general area. And of course, you guys, I teach my dogs when in doubt, take the jump. So I've got that kind of underlying um, understanding on my hands. We're, um, we started at four and it's about um, five minutes to five. And some of you may be wanting to um, wrap it up. So if you're wanting to wrap it up and you have a question, ask it now. I'm happy to, I'll talk endlessly. Gwen is throwing her hands up. Are you ready to go, Gwen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so... You hinted at pits and pieces of this, and part of this may be different because, of course, I do AKC, not USDAA. So in the past, since I haven't now competed for a while, I have found that I thought I was very good and very flexible, and that depending upon the flow of the course, I had some courses I was completely, almost completely silent for, and other courses I talked more, what I thought was appropriate to the course. Um, we haven't talked a whole lot about that. You know, I've kind of congratulated myself on doing what I thought was appropriate and had good success with that. Um, but I don't know if that's something that you want to address, if that really ties in with this or not, as far as being able to assess course design and how much you chat and how much you don't. Yeah, I have a, I have a pretty strong feeling that you and I aren't on the same page with that. What I want to do is what I would do for the dog, whether the course says it or not. So if, if I have things that I do and say that mean turn tight, and I've got other things like it's a corner and I'm gonna get it anyway, like, or um, it's a no brainer to the tunnel and I'm gonna get a go on, go on anyway, because of the course design, I'm more wanting my, I'm saying it I'm not, because I don't want to be in the position, Gwen, of having to make the decision of what the cue is based on the course design. Because I just want to do what my dog thinks it means. So I, because I. So you don't think if it's, it, well, what I would say, and of course this is my determination, not my dog's, but what should be straightforward, you know, go down this line of jump where it's very, it's a straightforward line of jump other than possibly saying go on, but that may not even be necessary. You wouldn't what? just, I don't need to say anything. I can just keep my mouth shut. And work go. On you let me go. You let me go right now. Let me go. <laughs> you do okay. because what's uh, that row of jumps to that tunnel or that obvious thing, you've got that line set. There's no such thing as obvious, man, because, because if you're saying to that dog, if I don't do anything, just steal obstacles. So that's why I don't want to live there. So what I'm saying is because then you're putting this dog, the dog in this default situation that you're going to have to live with and it's going to bite you in the butt. So if, so if I want my dog to go on, go on, go on, even if it's because the courses turn that I can't have the dog thinking, oh, I've got this. So I'm green lighting. That's one of my verbals, a green lighting um, gas pedal word. So even if it's obvious, they are hearing go on, go on, go on. Because absence of go on, go on, go on, my dogs taught me this. I didn't teach them this, but I, it works for us both. Absence of it means there's probably a turn cue coming in your future. So, so, and judges will do this shit. They'll have a side of the course where it is this obvious straight road jumps into a tunnel and you come around on the same loop and then you're going to make a hard right or they got to turn off of you. 
So um, I'm never really thinking uh, that I want the dog making the decision of, oh, I've got this. They are hearing the, 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 the thing that I would be saying if it wasn't obvious. Okay. I hope that, I hope you guys got that, Lonnie. Yeah. I have a I have a easy question. I think it it goes back to Dev's question. Mm -hmm. um, Jax has a quick release on a um, contact obstacle. So, but I always say break. I say it really fast. So if I've got a hook right after, like he's got a hook right off the dog walk. That's my question: Is do I go break hook? You know, I mean, how do I? How do I do that quickly enough or do I just lose the break and just say hook? So when you say he has a quick release, so in my world, there's a um, a quick, whether it's a quick release or a stick is, is handler determined. He sticks so, it. Yeah. So you have a stopped contact and you can stick it for as long as you want every yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to clarify terminology there. So I, oh, can I, I'm going to tell just a quick story. I'm at Nationals and there is, um, uh, and I always insisted that I used a formal release word and then the directional. So uh, for years, Lonnie, I said it's break and then left or right. And we were looking at a course and it was two tunnels. There was a tunnel, the dog, it was contact and the the discrimination tunnel that they turned into and there was a tunnel in front too and nancy guys and i were you know i'm going she goes well there's your there's your you're not going to be able to use your release for them yeah yeah i will and she goes you won't be able to because you're going to say break and he's going to be in that tunnel i'm like uh, -uh, uh i'm gonna say break left i'm gonna say break hook like <laughs> i'm gonna do just what you said and i said brah and he was in <laughs> <laughs> the first tunnel. So I then that day uh, taught that the, I will sometimes release you. And um, I'll plant a little seed here. So I've been strongly advocating that you always use the most appropriate, most significant, most right on the money um, verbal. So instead of saying jump, I'm going to say wrap right? Instead of saying jump, if I want extension, I'm going to call that jump, go on. So I'm starting to release on more specific things as well, more and more. I always, I always had that break meant take what's obvious and that I would tell you left or right or hook my generic turn away um, as a release cue. But don't expect your dog to know that. You will have to teach because if you just say left or hook, He's going to go, oh, no, 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 no. I wait for my break. But you can break it. <laughs> you can break it. You can teach him. But yeah. So release him on the directional. Thanks. And sometimes I'll release if there's a dis, if I, there, he stopped on the dog walk and there's two obstacles like a tunnel and the poles, I'll release on here poles, here poles. So I'm not using the break at all because sometimes you guys, if you've got a border collie, they're down at the bottom of that contact, you know, going which one, which one, which one. If you say break, you know, at the wrong time, they're just going to go to whatever they were scanning at that second. So I just, yeah, I hope that made it, I hope that was clear.